Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the RSA. I'm Jonathan Schiffers. I'm Director of Public Services and Communities here. Delighted to welcome you to today's special event with Richard Sennett. Um, before we begin, the quick housekeeping is please don't interrupt our broadcast with uh, a mobile phone sound. Um, this is being live streamed, um, so people are that includes you. Um, so people are watching online right now. Hello to our online audience. Um, doesn't mean you have to turn your phone off. We also have a hashtag for the event, so we'd love your thoughts and comments and questions when we get to that point um, on Twitter. If you're in the room, use your hand and raise a question. There'll be time for questions. But people on, online, you can uh, submit your questions via Twitter using the hashtag RSA City. Now, housekeeping over, I'm just going to introduce uh, Richard Sinnott uh, quickly. Richard has that great position, in my mind at least, of being a public intellectual. And uh, by that, I mean that while he's dropped anchor at several universities, and, uh, at LSE, NYU, Cambridge, MIT, Harvard, he really spends his time thinking and talking and writing on issues that affect us all. And those are how do we get the urban environments that do us good as humans and avoid creating those that don't welcome humanity and civic participation, democracy, and inclusion, all the values that we hold dear, especially in this organization. And Richard is essentially a teacher as well as a practitioner who's worked on everything from small urban parks to UN policy on urban environments. His career has been guided by a profound and humane interest in how people make sense of their lives, specifically the cities they live in and the work that they do. And while there's a focus on cities, and everyone's focusing on cities right now, you know, there's relevance to all of us who live in market towns laid out by the Romans or in small crowded cathedral cities that are a legacy of medieval development patterns, and, and Richard is a, a scholar of history in that regard. He writes very, very well, and I can thoroughly recommend buying, borrowing, or stealing uh, this book, Building and Dwelling, which we're going to talk about today, Ethics for the City. It's the latest in a trilogy on craft, collaboration, and the, the art and science of city building. Um, there are classics, too, that, that Richard's written, The Uses of Disorder, The Fall of Public Man, I read a book called The Conscience of the Eye about 10 years ago. I picked it up from my dad's bookshelf. And then I took the opportunity to study with Richard a decade ago at MIT. And just a, a quick story on that, Richard. This was the least structured and yet the most intellectually stimulating and satisfying class that I can remember taking at, at university. I mean, it was really a discussion group where students from very different academic disciplines considered what was involved in making a city successful against a very broad set of criteria about what success could look like, a self-defined set of criteria. We were empowered to do that. You realized that half the class hadn't been to Venice, halfway through a lecture you were giving on Venice, and you used your budget to take us to Venice. I think your principle is, you know, you need to be in cities to understand them and live them and observe them and see them and talk to people in them. And whether you intended it or not, the class was kind of a, a microcosm for the kind of city and the kind of analysis that I think you value, which is informal, interactive, creative, and experiential. But why do we need another book on cities? Uh, the purpose, I think, is for, for Richard to explore and analyze the relationship between how cities are planned and built and how people actually come to live in them, inhabit them, dwell in them, and experience them. And the book kind of masterfully draws on thinkers, philosophers, novelists, activists, and artists to explain the emergence over the 19th, 20th century of the urban age that we now have in the 21st century and will become true on every continent by the end of the century. The urban environment now is not only the site where billions of people live their individual personal lives, but the interaction of those lives, of working lives, of community work, projects of uh, collective and creative endeavor are crucial in making steps forward in human progress. This mural around you is the story of human progress and this room was designed as an open and inclusive room to host events like this, talks, lectures, exhibits, awards, and, and include the whole of the public in, in, in debating what it means to, to make progress and, and build a good society. So we should be as concerned now as ever about how we design and build and redesign and rebuild cities with a more ambitious ethical purpose, enabling more people to participate, to adapt to the complexities of life, benefit from its richness and productive potential. And these questions and challenges about the impact of place on the quality of individual and civic life are really important to us at the RSA because they're at the heart of a lot of the research that we've been doing. So we've worked with developers to think about what it takes to build what we call socially productive places. We concur with Richard's conclusions that the interactions we form with strangers 
as much as with neighbors and friends and, 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 and colleagues, the interactions we have around key institutions like parks and like schools should take priority in, in plans. How do we design for that interaction? Participation, inclusion, governance, management, these matter as much as, if not more than, the vision of the individual architect or master planner. Next week we'll publish on what forms of co-housing and co-living might offer in creating a more equitable housing system responsive to how people want to live their lives today in a place like London. And I think me personally and you guys, are, we're in for a treat as we hear from Richard today, drawing on the unrivaled depth of, of his wisdom and his insight to inform our work and hopefully yours too. There'll be plenty of time for your comments and questions, um, but now let's get started and join me in welcoming Richard Sinnott. Such a difficult student. <laughs> I remember that. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, this book is, uh, a, is not like the books I've written before because about oh, I guess 30 years ago, I um, decided that I had, it's a standard midlife crisis, that I had to do something uh, different. And in my case, that was to stop just writing about cities and also uh, become a practitioner. Uh, and I, I soon started working for the UN because about 30 years ago, um, uh, the cities in the developing world were exploding. And uh, I was a consultant. I had been a consultant to them for the last 30 years, as well as teaching. And I've tried to put these two sides of my life together and have not succeeded. And I'm going to tell you why that is in this lecture, what the difficulty of putting things together is. I have a view of a certain kind of city that we should make, um, which is an open city. And I think it's a, uh, as a practitioner, I've tried to explore ways to put it into place in uh, places like um, uh, Delhi um, or Beirut. But I think some of the principles apply equally to London. And during the discussion, I hope we, we get the time to talk about that. But I, I want to start with, with, I think, a problem that bedevils all urbanists. And if you'll permit, I'm just going to read the first paragraph of my, of my expensive, beautifully produced, inexpensive, beautifully produced book. That's a Freudian slip. Um, um, just to explain to you what the difficulty we have about opening a city is. In early Christianity, city stood for two cities, the city of God and the city of man. St. Augustine used the city as a metaphor for God's design of faith. But the ancient reader of St. Augustine, who wanted the alleys, markets, and forums of Rome, would get no idea of how God worked as a city planner. Even as this Christian metaphor waned, the idea persisted that city means two different things. One is a physical fact, a physical place, the other is a mentality compiled from perceptions, behaviors, and beliefs. <clears throat> the French language first came to sort out this distinction by two, using two different words, ville et cité, with a little mark on the end. Initially, this, these named big and small. Ville referred to the overall city, whereas cité designated a particular place. But sometime in the 16th century, the cité came to mean the character of life in a neighborhood, the feelings people harbored about neighbors and strangers and attachments to place. This old distinction has faded now, at least in France, as cité now most often refers to those grim locales which warehouse the poor on the outskirts of towns. The older usage is worth reviving, though, because it describes a basic distinction. The built environment is one thing, 
and how people dwell in them another. And here I'm going to give you a very New York reference. Today in New York, traffic jams at the very poorly designed tunnels get to get into the city belong to the veal, whereas the rat race driving so many New Yorkers to the tunnels at dawn belongs to the cité. Um, we often think in planning that we should build the way people live, that the veal, in other words, should follow the pathways of the cité. And I learned very early on in, as a practical planner that this was too simple. Uh, my first planning job was for the city of Boston uh, and during a period where Boston was heavily segregated racially. And the only way to overcome this segregation, or one of the only ways to do it, was to bus black children into white working class neighborhoods. Those were particularly segregated venues. Uh, so they went to school together. And um, uh, to do that, we as planners had to provision for uh, places for the buses to park, to bring the children in and to uh, take them back home. We had to build parking lots. The white working class community resisted us in the name of uh, what they call, they said, we want parks rather than parking lots. Uh, but the subtext of that was no Negroes here. Right? Uh, if you have a space for them, the wrong sort of people will come. And I have to say that my bosses, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm happy to say, resisted this claim. They didn't succumb to class guilt. And we built those parking lots. Uh, very, very contentious. It's a case in which the veal um, should prevail over the cité, that justice should prevail over community. And it gives an opposite side to the usual way we think about this relation, that there are these monstrous capitalist planners who just want to destroy local communities and put up as along the South bank in London, um, uh, high expensive high rises with maybe a poor door at the back for a few token uh, affordable uh, housing. That's the usual way we think about this, that the veal imposes unjustly on the city. It's a much more complicated relationship. Um, for, uh, in the developing world, the most popular form of residential housing is the gated community. That is, how to keep people out. Something both physically and literally a walled community. And in the UN, part of what we have taken on board is to resist in investing in communities which are gated. Uh, it's the same problem. And in my own view, the ethics of the city is that any young planner or architect should go hungry rather than build a gated community. But I uh, say this to you because this is, there is an asymmetry between the built and the lived. It's not just a simple thing of planners and architects reflecting what people want when what people want is bad. You know? And that, in the 30 years that I've now been in practice, that asymmetry is something I've tried not to solve, but to live with. And the way I've tried to engage with it and live with it is through uh, this concept of the open city. Uh, it's a concept that when you were my student, I was just really learning at Harvard from people who did open systems theory uh, at MIT, uh, from people who did open systems theory at MIT in the Media Lab. And they, their idea of it was that an open system 
should, well, I'll tell you how they, they thought about it. The Media Lab was largely uh, subsidized by the Microsoft co Corporation. And these Media Lab engineers and computer programmers loathed the Microsoft Corporation. They had absolutely no respect for it because of the way in which the Microsoft con Corporation, they thought, wanted to conduct an experiment. The Microsoft Corporation wanted answers to problems. They wanted best practices. They wanted, if there was an issue, they wanted a solution. In technical terms, this is a closed system. That is, uh, and if you want to think of it in truly technical terms, it's, a, it's like Boolean algebra, which is a truth functioning algebra. And instead, the, micros, the, micros, the Media Lab people wanted an open kind of system, one which explored ambiguities, one which didn't deal in yes, no, but maybe, one which at the extreme uh, looked at insoluble problems. And this is the model for that is Bayesian kinds of uh, algebras at the extreme that they explore things like pure chance. For the people in the, micro, the, the, the media lab, they, they snooted at closed system thinking as unproductive, as static. And they privileged open system thinking as a way of innovation. And I took this as their near neighbor. I really took this on board and asked myself, what would an open city look like in these technical terms, and how could we develop it? And I have, you know that all college professors are enormously long-winded. This was my first two minutes to you, so <laughs> now, now I will speed up about this. Um, does this work? There we are. This is my ideal of an open city for the, um, where is the little thing that is the, um, the, the um, I don't want to turn anything off. It's this, I think. Can you see, um, does, do you know, does it, where's a pointer on this? <laughs> You're as bemused as I am about it. It's all right. Tim Berners-Lee, who's my colleague at MIT, could barely, Use one of these things. You're, 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 in, good, you're in good hands. Uh, this is a place called Nehru Place in, um, in Delhi. We're very interested in this place, and I'm going to just explain it to you briefly. Uh, the, 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 the floor here is actually the top of a subterranean parking garage that goes down three stories. The sides here were originally offices for, built for bureaucrats in uh, Delhi who would park the car on below and come up here. In the course, uh, it was built in the late 70s, early 80s. In the course of its evolution, this became, the, this became a place which opened up to people who were selling goods of all kinds, saris, food, and particularly illegal or semi-legal uh, electronics goods, like this phone purchased there, which happened to fall off the back of a truck. You know, that sort of kind of informal um, uh, form of commerce. And the sides, you're looking at the Silicon Alley of Delhi. The sides are all filled no longer with office workers for government, but with startups, mostly electronic startups. Uh, this seemed to us, there are lots and lots of attempts to tear this down and remake something that is more fixed and formal. And we are engaged, I, I want, actually want UNESCO to list this as a World Heritage Site. It is a very model of how you can generate both economic growth in the city, because a lot of these, these people are prospering by this large market, and also social openness. 
This is one of the few places in India, in Delhi, where Muslims and Hindus rub shoulders easily, and with, where Dalits and higher classes also physically intermix without the fear of touching a Dalit. You know what a Dalit is? We're formerly called untouchables. And that still persists, but not here. It is a space in which people uh, are open in the sense of mixed. They don't talk much to each other, but their physical presence is, uh, is, is open. It contrasts to a project, let me see if I can do this. By the way, this is, um, a, I have taken the New York example of this. This is what, uh, in Greenwich Village, what uh, an equivalent to um, uh, Nehru Place looks like in New York. Very mixed, open, lots of different kinds of people. The most racially integrated part of New York City, this, this little bit here. Uh, tourists and natives, that's a mixture I could do without. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's an amazing place. It contrasts, this is also space we're working in, it contrasts to um, this, which is a project that we helped finance uh, in Beijing. And I'll explain to you what the titles mean a little later. Uh, it's housing. Uh, it's got sanitation. It's, got, it's much more orderly than Nehru Place. And everything looks the same. And it's coming apart socially. Uh, drugs have reappeared here, anathema to Chinese, of course, but young people are having drugs here. It has a high suicide rate uh, relative to the rest of China, and suicide is not something the Chinese are at all easy about, and other forms of mental illness. There's no community, and more than that, there's no diversity here. And we, the UN, through the UN, DP helped create this. So the issue to, that's a kind of, in the world, practical world I've been in, that's a kind of uh, issue. How could we do uh, more of, how could we design this? This happened. No planner made this happen. Uh, what the planners made happen is uh, Beijing thing. That's design. So the question is, can you design things like informality, openness, and porosity? That's our big question. <coughs> Not true. Um, okay, well, I just have to show you this. The, 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 the evil genius of closed form is Le Corbusier, embodied by the Plan Voisin for uh, Paris in 1924-1925. Uh, uh, the, uh, the idea was to grade flat this wonderful, if any of you know the Marais, it's a wonderfully complex physical space. And his idea was to tear it all down and put in equal, uh, these equalized towers, which I have to say architecturally are beautiful but urbanistically are horrid. Uh, they, in technical terms, they are a closed system because the project is additive in the sense that you just keep adding, he wanted to add towers all over London, all over Paris. There are no boundaries to it. Uh, everything adds up because it's, it's the same, that it has homogeneous integer parts. That is that the whole is not greater than the sum of the parts. And that's a technical, um, uh, uh, there's no, syn uh, there's, uh, there's no uh, synchronous activity. That's technically part of a closed system and it's part of a, a, um, a closed urban system as well. The second issue, which I'm going to show you here, maybe we'll never get to how to change this, but I want to show you this, is something that we've been thinking at, about at the absolute opposite economic end 
of uh, the spectrum. Mazdar in the, UR, in the uh, Emirates is a smart city and its gazillions of euros have been uh, poured into this technological city. I'm going to show you one problem with it. Uh, this is a parking station for automated cars in Mazdar. And you can see it's very carefully thought out and so on. This is, thanks to Norman Foster, a car that they never imagined. He, he, he's a genius uh, as an engineer. And he figured out a way to light, both lighten the battery and shrink the size of the car itself. Which means that Mazdar station no longer works. And this is, it's, it's, the cars are too narrow, and when you step out of them into the station, you have, particularly if you're my age, you have this f nearly a foot gap. It's terrifying, because you, you know, fall into all of the stuff. It embodies a second principle of closure, which is a tight fit between form and function. When that fit is too tight, what you do is write a recipe for technological obsolescence. And in this case, what's happening is they're having to tear down the station, or big parts of it, to, where is this thing? Hello, I think it's gone. Can you see, oh, there it is. Uh, they're having to tear all this down in order to accommodate better cars. But this is a basic principle of closure in the urban environment, just as it is again in technology. When you have a tight fit, minimum fit, efficient fit between form and function, you have a brittle city. You build in technological obsolescence. And what is happening to the cities we know today is that they're closing because of both of these two um, uh, phenomena. Uh, they're additive, and the form fit, fit function is too tight. When I worked as a planner in New York, I saw a version of Mazdar when we tried to alter uh, office buildings in w the Wall Street area of New York into residences. And uh, because Wall Street is depopulating as the bankers flee here, and I don't know where they'll flee next, but uh, anyhow, the, the, it was, uh, um, the, we, we wanted to reuse the forms. And uh, they were built too efficiently the, uh, and too tightly. The service stacks, the toilets, all of this kind of stuff, the wiring, it was cheaper, in fact, to tear these buildings, some of which are down, some of which are wonderful, than to repair them. So uh, those, I think, are two, from the building side of building and dwelling, two big problems. How to build environments which are looser in their form fit, and environments in which the parts add up, the sum adds up to more than the the whole adds up to more than the sum of the parts. Now, in the next three minutes, give me two. You were such a good student. Give me two minutes more. <laughs> I'll show you the, uh, how we deal with this. One of the things we're really interested in is a border boundary distinction. And that is how to open up places in the city at their edges rather than in their centers. I'm not going to describe all of this to you at great length. But that's a boundary in Sao Paulo. It's, it's a beautiful one. Uh, here you have on, on the, here we are. Here on, on the right you can see is very expensive housing uh, with its individual swimming pools, which overlooks a favela. So that you're lounging by the pool, you're having your daiquiri, and you're looking out at the scene of dev devastation. Uh, that is a boundary, it's a tight, Divide. That's another kind of boundary in the socialist paradise of Venezuela, in which a um, highway serves the same purpose. So our idea is how to, to deal with this kind of issue 
both legally and physically by taking down these physical uh, barriers. You could say the same thing, if, if you're so minded, about the, the, the so-called security fence in Israel-Palestine, which is, uh, a, um, and it's why we're so against it, uh, which is creates a boundary rather than a border. The sociological importance of this is that it privileges the edge rather than the center. And I'll give you one example of, for us, in UN um, uh, Habitat, what that meant. We had an opportunity to build um, a large number of community health centers. And rather than putting these health clinics, they're, by NHA standards, they're primitive. By the standards of places like Mumbai or Delhi, there they were a marvel. Rather than putting them in the center of communities, we put them at the edges against the kind of common sense of uh, planning that you know central resources should be located centrally. We built these centers in no man's land or in places where people didn't want to cross. Here, we would have shrunk the road and put a health center here if uh, Chavez had ever allowed us to, to come to Venezuela. Uh, that's, that's the kind of thing we would have done. So that's one of the ways in which um, uh, you can open up a city by opening up its edges rather than privileging its centers. Uh, that's a, no, this is too long to describe this nightmare. This is the center of Shanghai. Um, I'm going to skip the density thing. The second big thing we're doing, and those of you who are architects will, will, uh, um, uh, will recognize this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Enrique Arevena's uh, uh, Iquique Chile uh, uh, project which is basically rather than build a complete environment for poor people, which is of low quality, give people half a good house and let them build the rest of it themselves. And that is a, that's a, uh, an investment in quality um, that we are trying, that UN Habitat is trying to spread throughout the UN. That is to engage people in the making of their own habitats rather than give them a habitat to live into. It can produce results like this, which drive the architect nearly to, to suicide, because this is really ugly. He, particular, oops, he particularly hates this window. This window here, this little Spanish colonial window. He's, I mean, he's an architect, he's won the Pritzker Prize, he's got a great taste. Uh, but that is a consequence of co-production, you know, that you have a different judgment of quality than pure standards of, of beauty. So we're, uh, I had some taste of this working on a project uh, about incomplete, reconceiving incompleteness in New York. This is the under, uh, the, it's, it's like the West Way here. But in New York, this particular viaduct um, has to the south largely a white community at Columbia University, and to the east, uh, the poorest part of Harlem. And to bring these two communities together, we put in a grocery store underneath the highway, almost deafening to buy groceries there, but it brought blacks and whites together uh, because, and particularly important for Harlem because it had no grocery stores. It only had these very expensive, usually Korean-run shops. Uh, and it is a place where blacks and whites physically began to mix crossing the color line in Harlem. The reason I bring this up to you is that lots of infrastructure in uh, cities, both here and abroad, can serve as incomplete form, to be filled in in uh, ways that the planners never intended. This is, it's an, in technical jargon, this is a nonlinear development. 
in planning school, you would never tell people underneath the highway, put a grocery store. You know, it just doesn't, you know, that's not what they're paying their 18,000 pounds for. They want logical progression from A to B to C. But that is not the open way, which is a, a non-linear form of building. And the third thing we're doing, which I want to show you, is uh, this. We're trying to modulate between the, build, the informal and the formal in the same buildings. You remember I showed you uh, Nehru place in the beginning, which it, it's a very strange pointer. Hello. There you are. Uh, that the indoor equivalent of Nehru place in Bogota is this floor full of illicit goods and people who trade on the tops of, um, of overturned plastic cartons, uh, uh, cardboard cartons. If they're successful, they move up and they put sheetrock um, uh, to make sort of proto offices. They're still dealing in untaxed goods, but they have a clientele who searches them out. And if they're even more successful, they begin dealing in taxable uh, goods, uh, they, um, and they become proper shops. Now, it's not Piccadilly Arcade. Right? But it's like it in that there are a small number of self-sustaining, profitable businesses. We are faced in the UN with a logic in which developers, private developers, hate buildings like this. They loathe it. They, these are particular targets to, to, to bring down, buildings which are mixed economically in use. They're targets of... Um, uh, be, because nobody actually lives here. And there are literally millions of these buildings in, uh, throughout the developing world. And as, a poli as policy planners, we're trying to, um, to save buildings like this, to argue that this is an essential part of the open city, that there's a modulation from informal to formal. Uh, I should just end by saying that what you'll see about in all these projects is that this it's physical planning and it doesn't have to do much with verbal interchange or uh, uh, getting together uh, through words. One thing that's happened to me in the course of the last 30 years about working projects like this is that I have become less and less attuned to city planning that is done verbally and more to city planning that deals with people's nonverbal physical relations with each other in the city. Their bodily relations rather than the words that they exchange. And all these projects, I mean I haven't been the boss uh, you know, on all these projects. But all, uh, I and my group, uh, UNDP uh, and UN Habitat, have, we've all taken a, a similar journey, as the Americans would say, to focus less on words and more on places, physical places. So I'm sorry I've run over a little bit, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. OK, so think of your questions. I've thought of mine. I'm going to give you one question, Richard, um, to expand on something in your book. And then we'll take more from the floor and more online from Twitter as well. Don't raise your hands yet, but think of your questions. OK, um, I want to talk about money. Money makes the world go round. Money finance uh, is crucial to building and rebuilding cities. Right. In the book, you reference some of Jane Jacobs' uh, phraseology around the difference between gradual money which is kind of organic and is generated by the profits in a place, let's say, and what she calls cataclysmic money, which is kind of globally wired and can come into a place and do all sorts of transformative things. And, and you know, you've, you've given us some examples of the kind of spaces that are open and attractive and we should support and encourage and try and build. But is our finance system 
fit for purpose? Is it supportive to that? Do we need, how do we change finance in order to build the kind of ethical city that you're encouraging us to? Well, I don't think we could follow her because it's not only local scale that she's interested in, but slow. That is, her notion of economic development is something that takes generations uh, uh, to accumulate that kind of capital. We don't have that time. When you're dealing with, say, 700,000 to a million people who don't have clean water, you can't wait gradually for the water to purify. So um, I have to say, I admire Jane Jacobs really a lot. She was a friend. But it just doesn't work in terms of the, the realities of the, um, of the developing world. What does work? is something rather different, which is that we invest in, um, uh, in projects at a kind of reasonable uh, scale within the city, rather than something we were talking about before. Rather than do one 600 million euro mega project, why not do 600 1 million euro projects? and distribute them around the city. That's what Medellin did, for instance, when it built its library system, when, finally when the conflicts ended uh, about uh, 12, 15, 14 years ago, which is they commissioned lots of small community libraries rather than build a central library. And that, in my book, I talk about this as type forming, taking mm -hmm. something that the whole city needs and then figuring out ways to do it at a scale where you build lots of versions of that rather than one big central version. So, and it's cheaper in the end. Uh, when you have to build a huge project, uh, complete, you're spending a lot more money than if you're building, giving the DNA for a project can develop over time but still is workable from the beginning. That's what Nehru Place is like. Mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, you know, it took money. This is not a, a community project. This, it's a parking garage mm -hmm. you know, with offices. It takes money. It's not going to come from the people themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's cheaper than doing the kind of mega planning that Modi and his henchmen want to do in India today. Mm -hmm. So that's to me the economics of this, that we have to type form, see what the whole city needs, and then figure out ways to distribute it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Lots of hands. OK. I'm going to take uh, the lady in the second row here. And oh, that's great. The I can lady actually see the there third are row lights. there. And then I'll come back to the floor. So those two first, we'll take them together and then hear from Richard. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much. Um, we already just update you. Uh, we already work with uh, uh, Resilium uh, Forms, which is a Peter Head. I'm not sure you're familiar, uh, know him. And uh, it's an ecosystem from the uh, ground, and we build up the digital. Uh, uh, ups, uh, over the ground, like a digital architect, digital um, infrastructures, mm -hmm. digital applications, everything integrated with the, all the genealogy kind of all the resources together, we will have an optimized solution for the planning. Thank yes, you. I'm against that. <laughs> and why? I'm against it because an optimized solution is your solution. And integration, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, Integration uh, is a form of closure. What we need is something that's open-ended. Well, I'm, I'm sure it is. But it, it, um, the, the notion that everything fits together in a city neatly is, I think, it's, uh, it's not technically a good idea. And politically, it's horrible. Because the fitting together is done by someone who is probably not you. So I, I'm really opposed to that kind of planning. We can talk about this more. But, but it's already be um, advised by the uh, UN anyway. So it's, it's done. But your yeah. weakness, <laughs> you, you point to the weakness, be already uh, uh, resolved in that open platform. Yeah. Yeah, it's really depend on what people's needs. It's a dynamic. 
yeah. Let's take another question. You can, you can look at that platform for yourself and decide whether it's too closed or, or just about open enough. Uh, resilience, uh, the question was here. Thank you. Uh, where's your favorite city and why? Ah, I'll tell you, I have two. One of them is London, which is why I'm glad I work, particularly the eastern parts of London, which, uh, because it's very porous and very open. And in uh, the developing world, I actually love Delhi. And if I didn't live here, and I were younger, I wouldn't live uh, there for the same reasons. Although it's so polluted that at my age, it's not, it's not possible. Um, but I, you know, I think London has, I know people complain about this and that and so on. But it's, I mean, it's an amazing city. It's amazingly open, much more so than New York which is very segregated by class as well as race. There aren't housing projects scattered throughout the whole city, for, for instance, uh, estates and so on. I just, uh, you know, I think it's something, I know British people love to moan, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, relatively, this seems to me such a livable city, and uh, such an open city. What would you show someone in East London to, to demonstrate that openness? What do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, probably things, uh, it, it depend who they were and how much I wanted to shock them. Commercial Street, mm -hmm. which is near where I live, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the Athenian Agora, you know. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of this, I'm very sad that Robin Hood Gardens came down because I think a lot of uh, so-called sink estates in uh, London are anything but. They're very good quality. Peckham seems to me a kind of marvel. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful, no, the center of Peckham is wonderful. And, um, uh, but it's, it's mixed, you know, it's gentrified. And, places that will never gentrify. Yeah. Anyhow, i just say this to you. I, it's, it's really struck me over the last 30 years. Every time I would come back from one of these, going to places like Riyadh, and going from Riyadh to London is like going from the most controlled, awful environment to a place where you feel you could really live. You know? Mm -hmm. So don't put yourselves down. Let's take, <laughs> let's take two more. I'll take the gentleman at the back and then the lady with the glasses, three rows from the back there. So. Uh, my profession uh, is making great claims about placemaking. But uh, an organization called Common Ground gave me uh, what I think is much more accurate, that a place is a space with meaning. I run a project called the Clockwork Commons in which I'm tr trying to be the steward of the public realm in the core of Clerkenwell to encourage people to talk to each other and understand their area. Do you think it's possible to steward an area and that everybody can be partly stewards of their own area? Gosh. Let's take the other question and then we'll come back to both. Okay. Hi, um, I work with a lot of um, museums and educational uh, frameworks and just wondered if you had any comments about um, how we facilitate schools and the next gen in, in this context of open space. Oh, that's a good question. Well, they're both good questions. Um, I think a lot of placemaking, if you're asking me personally, a lot of placemaking means uh, being in, in places where people can stay rather than passing through. And um, the issue for, um, I mean, when you travel through a, uh, 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 somewhere at a rapid speed, you experience it as, as space. When you slow down, you experience it at a place that some of that is physiological, that we take in a lot more lateral information the slower we move. And we move very rapidly as on a highway. Uh, we're obliged physically uh, not to really notice where we are. My idea about placemaking, which I probably is, is complementary to yours, 
is that the more different sorts of things that are in a place, the more people are likely to notice where they are. It's why I'm against historic districts that embalm a place uh, so that nothing is allowed to jar or uh, uh, intrude that's modern. And equally, why I think planners have to ex exercise the judgment, and it's, in my view, an ethical judgment, to defeat the notion that places look modern and up to date, that you keep, um, that you eschew the, the Corbusian notion of great flat and build. I like spaces that are complex rather than clear. That's my guide for what a good, a good place is, that it's complex. It needs interpretation. Uh, it can't be simplified. Uh, and that's, I think, kind of places that attach people to where they are, rather than places which are legible, clarified, easy to read, I, with, I think, are places that are less likely to build attachments to place. So I think that's a, probably complementary to what you're talking about. About um, cultural facilities, I'm going to put in a plug for this. In my old age, I've started a, um, a charity here called Teatro Mundi, which is just down the street and which is going to do things with the RSA, which brings together performing artists and urbanists. They have to be under 35. That is half my age to participate in this. I'm the only bold person in, in, in my charity. Uh, and the notion about this is to find new ways to rather than, say, spend 600 million pounds on a new concert hall to decentralize culture and, uh, throughout the city and to find the artists who could participate that and the means of, again, it's the same model, how to build 600 performing arts spaces rather than one concert hall for one uh, admittedly very good conductor, but. You know, it's a lot of, that's money taken away from other people. So we are engaged in a big project now called Cultural Infrastructure, which is about really this typeforming of just the way the libraries are in Medellin, typeforming culture, cultural spaces here. And it's got a political point to it. I don't mean to just point to the Barbican. We're also building in London, we're building, the, uh, what's it called? The cultural um, zone, you know, uh, out, it's got an, it's been rebaptized. It used to be called the Olympicopolis, and they've rebranded it. Uh, the, the disused sites of um, uh, the Olympics. A huge amount of money is being poured into this space. And all around it, uh, our artists working in studios, uh, Stratford East has a wonderful theater which is disused. You know, the money gets concentrated in, does anybody remember what this is, Olympicopolis is rebranded? The Cultural Quarter, mm -hmm. that's it, the Cultural Quarter. Terrible, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. So, I mean, the notion of typeforming that's in this book is how do you work at a large scale, but spread around the goodies, basically. And I think that's as true in culture as it is in education or in health. It's the same principle, you know? How do you disperse large amounts of money quickly over a, a large field in the mm -hmm. city? Good, let's take Two more. So the gentleman with the goatee, if I may say so, in that row, and then the woman with the glasses in the front row down here. You didn't switch them around. <laughs> um, your vision seems to be antithetical to a high-rise city. I was wondering how many stories do you think that um, this would work at up to? Ah, that's such a good question. One of the slides I didn't show you, and I've been told I can't go back to them, is that a research that we have been doing at the, at the London School of Economics is how can you achieve the same 
densities in mixed forms of use of use a building that you achieve in the tower. It, this is a piece of research to do this. And we've, we're experimenting with all sorts of ways of understanding the relationship between form, density, and size. It is amazing to me, this started with Richard Rogers when he wrote the white paper for London, you remember that? Yeah, a long time ago. And was carried on for us uh, with an Indian architect who suddenly just died named Charles Correa, where we did these studies of how you can build high density uh, without building towers. And you can do it residentially, you ziggurats, you know, you can find all sorts of forms which are not just simply traditional street forms, which have a lot of open space, a lot of green space, and so on but are also, also porous spaces. Uh, and I, they show some of them in my book. You can see more of them in a book by Fran Tonkis, T-O-N-K-I-S-S, on urban design. Excellent book. Um, but this is a real holy grail, I think, for cities. Uh, you have to shut me up about this, because once I get started... I was going to say, if you Google typology of density, you can see some of those yeah, I want to say just once more about this. This is a recovery of an urban form called cell cellular urban form. And that's really important. We need to learn how to rebuild, you know, like... A, um, uh, you know, a cellular city is like Marrakesh, or, you know, that's uh, courtyard cities, or traditionally in, the, uh, in uh, Beijing. We need to modernize that. We need to take that as a type form and find ways to make it dense, clean, and, and so on. And I think it can be done. Hello? Oh, sorry. Um, so the term gentrification has been increasingly thrown around um, and seen in you know, places like East London. Um, right. How do you think it contributes whether negatively or positively, to open spaces and open systems? Ah, I didn't feed her this. <laughs> That's a good question. I, I, this may seem really stupid to you, but I think we can easily solve the problem of gentrification. It's called rent control, and rent control applied to small commercial businesses as well as to housing. I think this is a no-brainer, and unfortunately, uh, every, almost every developer hates it. Uh, but rent control, the stabilization of prices of small enterprises and flats in which people have lived for a long time, is uh, a really effective way to slow down gentrification. There are some aspects of gentrification. If you're into organic food, you know, you want, you, you want gentrified. Uh, I mean, that's an ethical problem you face. But uh, you know what I mean. There, it's all right in its place. But the, the sway of gentrification in places like London is due to the fact that it has a free market. And I just, it's so simple. If you restrain the market, you will restrain gentrification. That is, you have to think more like a socialist and less like a capitalist. Okay. On those fine words, Richard, <laughs> we're going to have to draw it to a close. Um, Richard will be out in the foyer here signing books and selling books. If you have your question, I think you will, yeah. You, you will. The, um, if you have questions you couldn't quite get, you may have a few seconds to do so there. Okay. Keep the conversation going on Twitter on the hashtag RSA City. But thanks again for spending an hour with us, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks again to Richard Sennett. <laughs>